the loveliest tinkle as of golden bells answered him. It is the fairy language. You ordinary children can never hear it, but if you were to hear it, you would know that you had heard it once before. Tink said that the shadow was in the big box. She meant the chest of drawers, and Peter jumped at the drawers, scattering their contents to the floor with both hands as kings toss halfpence to the crowd. In a moment he had recovered his shadow, and in his delight he forgot that he had shut Tinkerbell up in the drawer. If he thought at all, but I don't believe he ever thought, it was that he and his shadow, when brought near each other, would join like drops of water, and when they did not, he was appalled. He tried to stick it on with soap from the bathroom, but that also failed. A shudder passed through Peter, and he sat on the floor and cried. His sobs woke Wendy, and she sat up in bed. She was not alarmed to see a stranger crying on the nursery floor. She was only pleasantly interested. Boy, she said courteously, why are you crying? Peter could be exceedingly polite also, having learned the grand manner at fairy ceremonies, and he rose and bowed to her beautifully. She was much pleased and bowed beautifully to him from the bed. What's your name? he asked. Wendy Moira, Angela Darling, she replied with some satisfaction. What is your name? Peter Pan. She was already sure that he must be Peter, but it did seem a comparatively short name. It doesn't matter, Peter gulped. She asked where he lived. Second to the right, said Peter, and then straight on till morning. <laughs> what a funny address. Peter had a sinking. For the first time he felt that perhaps it was a funny address. No, it isn't, he said. I mean, Wendy said nicely, remembering that she was hostess. Is that what they put on the letters? He wished she had not mentioned letters. Don't get any letters, he said contemptuously. But your mother gets letters. Don't have a mother, he said. Not only had he no mother, but he had not the slightest desire to have one. He thought them very overrated persons. Wendy, however, felt at once that she was in the presence of a tragedy. Oh, Peter, no wonder you were crying, she said, and got out of bed and ran to him. I wasn't crying about mothers, he said rather indignantly. I was crying because I can't get my shadow to stick on. Besides, I wasn't crying. It has come off. Yes. Then Wendy saw the shadow on the floor looking so draggled and she was frightfully sorry for Peter. How awful, she said. But she could not help smiling when she saw that he had been trying to stick it on with soap. How exactly like a boy. Fortunately, she knew at once what to do. It must be sewn on, she said, just a little patronisingly. What's sewn? he asked. <laughs> You're dreadfully ignorant. No, I'm not. But she was exulting in his ignorance. I shall sew it on for you, my little man, she said though he was as tall as herself, and she got out her housewife, sewing bag, and sewed the shadow on to Peter's foot. I dare say it will hurt a little, she warned him. Oh, I shan't cry, said Peter, who was already of the opinion that he had never cried in his life, and he clenched his teeth and did not cry, and soon his shadow was behaving properly, though still a little creased. Perhaps I should have ironed it, Wendy said thoughtfully. But Peter, boy-like, was indifferent to appearances 
and he was now jumping about in the wildest glee. Alas, he had already forgotten that he owed his bliss to Wendy. He thought he had attached the shadow himself. How clever I am, he crowed rapturously. Oh, the cleverness of me! It is humiliating to have to confess that this conceit of Peter was one of his most fascinating qualities. To put it with brutal frankness, there never was a cockier boy. But for the moment, Wendy was shocked. You conceit, braggart, she exclaimed with frightful sarcasm. Of course, I did nothing. Narrated by Amanda Bailey